right in. So I am Caitlin. I am Halcyon's Community and Recruitment Manager. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you and so many entrepreneurs and business owners in Washington, D.C. to get a chance to talk to you a little bit more about Halcyon and the work we're doing. So my goal for the session is to try to make it as interactive as possible, um, which basically means um, not letting myself talk too long. I am a talker, and so I've been known to talk for long periods of time, uh, but I've kept it short. So I have a couple of slides to give you a brief overview of Halcyon and the work we're doing. Um, and then I wanna make sure that I leave time for questions at the end. And I thank you in advance for everyone that does have questions. You know, feel free to ask me about Anything, even if it feels like a small detail, I think questions are such a wonderful opportunity to really start conversations um, and to really start kind of digging into those details. Uh, so again, please don't hesitate to ask me anything that you can think of. And I thank you for having those questions at the end. Okay, so I'll hop right in. So who is Halcyon and you know, what do we do? Halcyon was founded in 2014, and we are a nonprofit that's based in Washington, D.C. We're actually right here in Georgetown. Our signature programs are fellowships that support early stage social entrepreneurs from around the world. So while Halcyon got started relatively recently, you know, we've been around for a few years, the seeds for what we do actually started much earlier when one of our co-founders, Dr. Kuno, was very early in her career. And she had an experience that had a really strong impact on her and really kind of drove forward a lot of um, the goals that she had and the mission that she had for her own life. And that experience was she was working as a researcher and she was working to find a cure for a disease and she failed. And she was in the really devastating position of having to tell the participants in her study that she had failed. Um, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be in that position, uh, but not surprisingly, this had a really big impact on her. And she kind of made this promise to herself in this moment that said, if at any point in the future, I'm in the position where I can be supporting the best and the brightest um, and individuals, no matter what their background is, no matter what their lived experience is, if they have the drive and they have the commitment to really supporting positive change throughout the world, throughout their communities, I want to find a way to help them take those bold risks to succeed. Um, and so that's really an underlying mission that kind of supports everything that Halcyon does. And that's really how we think about what are ways that we can be supporting social entrepreneurs, again, no matter what their lived experience is, no matter what their background is, if they have the drive and the vision and the bold ideas, how can we find ways to help support them? And the ways that we found to do that is primarily, primarily through our signature programs, which are our fellowship programs. So before I jump in more about Halcyon, um, I wanted to touch on like, what is a social venture? What is a social entrepreneur? It's a question I get a lot and it's a really great question. So when Halcyon's thinking about what a social entrepreneur is or what a social venture is, the core idea is this alignment of the profit with the purpose. So while Halcyon, ourselves, we operate as a nonprofit. The ventures that we support are for-profit ventures or hybrid ventures. Hybrid venture being a venture that has both a for-profit as well as a nonprofit arm. And again, the idea is not just about how do you make profit and how do you make money. That's an important part of a business, of course, but it's also what is this larger purpose that you have for being and how does this integrate it really within your business principles? So to give you a really quick example, maybe you are a restaurant and in addition to making delicious food, a really core purpose that you have at, in founding this restaurant is to create jobs that support economic mobility as well as skill acquisition to individuals that are traditionally under-resourced in our society or traditionally facing um, systemic barriers that prevent them from fully participating in society. And so this is this idea that while your restaurant grows and makes more money and maybe you expand to an additional location, you're also having this measurable impact where you're also creating more jobs for these individuals that you are wanting to support. And so that's kind of a way that you can be thinking about what does it mean to be a social entrepreneur? What does it mean to have a social venture? Also, I think it's important that I always like to know is that we also think about not just how do you positively impact people, but also maybe your social venture is positively impacting the environment. That would also be considered social entrepreneurship if you had that positive environmental impact piece as part of your business's purpose. 
So swinging back to Halcyon after that brief detour, uh, like I mentioned, Halcyon's signature programs are our fellowships. And we have two major um, kind of types of fellowships. One is our flagship residential fellowship, and this is the fellowship that actually started the Halcyon. That's our first fellowship that we offered, and we continue to offer two cohorts of eight ventures every year. We have a cohort that comes in in the fall and a cohort that call, comes in in the spring. And the reason it's the residential fellowship is because the fellows in this program actually receive housing at Halcyon for five months during their fellowship as well as weekly programming throughout that fellowship. The other type of fellowship we offer are our intensive fellowships. Well, our flagship fellowships are broad and they're open to social entrepreneurs from any sector, any industry, anywhere in the world. Our intensive fellowships are designed to be tailored to a specific um, group of entrepreneurs and what their needs might be. So it's almost, you can think about the residential fellowship as like a breadth, right? So it's like a wide ranging, all different aspects of an early stage business and intensives are really tailored and customized and focused in their support. Uh, so to give you an example, we recently had an intensive that was for all female tech founders from Bahrain, right? So we were looking at what are the really key critical components of support in areas that we can be supporting a female founder from Bahrain who is focused on tech. The different types of intensives that we offer vary from year to year. Um, so you can always be on the lookout for what a new intensive, what we're offering is for kind of a tailored group of individuals and entrepreneurs. The other thing I did want to mention is that in addition to talking about our fellowships supporting social entrepreneurs, they're also supporting early stage social entrepreneurs. So, in, and this again, this is across fellowship types. So both our intensive fellowships as well as our flagship residential. And so how we are defining and what an early stage entrepreneur is, that can be as early on as the idea stage. So you have this idea, you have this vision for this business that you want to be creating all the way up to about having $500,000 US dollars in annual revenue. We find that really the support that we offer through our programming and our skill development hits that range of individuals in the business development process really well. Okay, so to kind of talk a little bit more about Halcyon fellowships. I think there are a couple of key points that I like to point out. One is that our fellowships are offered free of charge for our fellows. You do not pay anything to be a Halcyon fellow. In addition to that, we are not taking any equity from your business um, in exchange for participating in the fellowship. Again, this comes back to Halcyon's mission of supporting the best and the brightest, no matter what your lived experience, what your background is. We set up as a nonprofit so that we can have alternative funding channels from um, grants and corporate partners and these other avenues so that we're not actually having to put a financial burden on our fellows to experience our programs. Another important part of our fellowships, and this goes across all of our fellowships, so both our intensive fellowships as well as our flagship residential, is that not only are we supporting the fellows venture to grow and scale, and we do, right? We do a lot of support in that area, different business areas. We also wanna make sure that we're supporting the fellow as a person, as an entrepreneur, as a leader. Um, and so we do that in a number of different ways, depending on the fellowship, everything from mentorship and leadership coaching, but really thinking about, you know, how do we help the founders to succeed? Um, anyone that's founded a business knows that it is a wild journey and there are high highs and there are really low lows. And how do we make sure that we're not just supporting the business through this wild journey, but also the founder as a person. And then why I'm here today, um, we have our applications are open for several of our fellowships. So applications for our flagship residential for our spring 2022 cohort are now open. And again, that's open to founders, any sector, any industry, as long as they're an early stage social entrepreneur from anywhere in the world. We also have our Opportunity Intensive Fellowship open. So this is designed specifically for entrepreneurs who are based in or primarily serving government designated opportunity zones in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Northern Virginia, really like that DMV region, but going all the way up to Baltimore City. 
And then we also have our Africa intensive, which I'm really excited about because this will be the first time we are offering this fellowship and it's open to entrepreneurs specifically from sub-Saharan Africa. The application deadline for all three of these fellowships is October 8th. It's actually one application and you can apply for up to two fellowships on that application. So if like you read more on our website and you're like, well, I'm kind of interested in the flagship residential, but I'm also kind of interested in one of these intensives and I fit the criteria for this intensive eligibility, you can actually be applying for both right on that one application. And then this is, you know, the nuts and bolts, the link. So how can you learn more about the specific benefits and um, aspects of our fellowships that are being offered in each of our fellowship is the link to our apply page on our website, which will then link you out to the individual pages with more information. If you're like, Caitlin, I'm hooked, I'm ready to apply, or I've heard about Halcyon in the past, and you had me all teed up, you can link to our application on our, the submittable platform. Um, if you have any questions after today, I have my email address, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but like I said, while I'm here, I welcome questions. So with that, I will wrap up my speaking portion and jump into your questions. Wonderful. I know we have a little bit of echo in this room at the library, so I'm going to ask um, Shannon if you're able to read some of the questions in the chat. Certainly. All right. So there are a few that have come through. The first one is right now we're an early stage nonprofit organization, but we have plans for a for profit business to support the nonprofit. Would we be eligible to apply for this opportunity? Absolutely. That's a really great question. Um, and I'm, this is why I love questions, right? Because you get to get into all the details. So you would, and you would be for two reasons. One, because we kind of work as early as the idea stage. So even though the for-profit part of the business is still in the idea stage, that would be eligible. And then when you're applying, you would actually want to select hybrid venture. Right, so because again, your long term goal for your vision is to have both a for profit and a non profit arm. So you could be applying and be eligible as a hybrid venture. You would just want to make it really clear in the application um, about what your vision is for the for profit side. And just really quickly, the reason for this is initially when Halcyon was created, we supported all venture types. So we supported hybrid, for profit, as well as non profit. And what we found is that as we were tailoring the resources that we had, the majority of the ventures that were applying, about 85% were for-profit or hybrid. And so naturally, as the resources got built out and the skill development, it was favoring that venture style. And there's just some you know, very different questions on, for example, like funding channels, if you're a nonprofit versus a for-profit. And so when we make this um, kind of delineation, it's not because we don't think that nonprofits are amazing and deserving of support, we're a nonprofit or ourselves. It's because we wanna make sure that fellows are investing their time in our program and that our programming is matching their needs. And so when you were thinking about if you were accepted to Halcyon, you would really wanna be thinking about, okay, well, the Halcyon resources are really gonna help us to develop that for-profit channel. Um, and if we get resources that help the nonprofit side as well, that's great, but that would be the mindset you would wanna be kind of approaching the application as well as approaching thinking about the fellowship program. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, another question has come through. Um, do you have any examples of social entrepreneurs who have come through before that might help me think about whether my company is a good fit? And how do I know if I am in an opportunity zone? Both great questions. Yeah, so there's lots of different entrepreneurs that have come through before. We are, the term we use is sector agnostic, which really just means like any industry, um, any um, background. So we have had entrepreneurs that have been in the health space. Um, we have had entrepreneurs that have been in like the livelihood space. We have had entrepreneurs in the data tech space. Uh, we have had entrepreneurs in the education space. So really, um, I think when you're thinking about fit, um, and this is something where I'd be happy to talk with this person kind of offline to really kind of go through this in more detail. 
I think the the couple of things that the call really hallmarks of the program. And I think one of the big hallmarks is like supporting investment readiness. So I think that businesses that are poised to be able to scale and grow sustainably is something that Halcyon's really good at helping out with. This doesn't mean that we think that every business needs to grow and get bigger to be successful, right? Like that's not true. There are many very successful businesses that never take on like outside investment, for example, um, and that do really well and have a really great impact and purpose. But I think a lot of the resources that Halcyon has is really for these businesses that are kind of looking to say like, what is my current footprint? What is my overall vision for growth? How do I grow and scale really successfully? Uh, so I think if you're coming from it from that perspective, I think you would be a good fit. As far as finding out as um, if you are in a, either in or primarily serving a designated opportunity zone, there are actually um, resources on government websites. So if you Google it, if you have any trouble finding it, if you just send me an email and let me know if you're in Maryland or actually you're in DC, answered my own question. Um, let me know. I'm happy to give you the link to the DC website and you can actually put in your address. It's super helpful and it will show you a map and tell you whether or not you're in an opportunity zone. Opportunity zone. I think I just saw a question that said I've applied Thanks. before and I wasn't accepted. Am I jumping ahead? I just happened to see. No, no, you're oh. you're you're teed up. I'm happy to read them out if it's easier for you. Um, and I'm also going to drop in that link in the chat now where you can confirm um, within DC the opportunity zone map. So I'll share that as well. Yeah. The other question is I have applied to Halcyon before, but wasn't able to get in for that round. Is it worth applying again? That's a great question. And so first, thank you for your interest in Halcyon. Thank you for applying um, in the past. I think one thing I always want to make clear to people is that our fellowships are highly, highly selective and highly competitive. That does not mean that we do not support the work you're doing or recognize the value of the work you're doing. It really just comes down to like funding constraints for us. Um, and so, for example, with our flagship residential fellowship, Typically, it's about a 2% acceptance rate. So we have about 500 applications for eight spots for ventures. Um, and so know that if you do apply for Halcyon and you are not accepted, you know, there's always many more fellows and applicants that we want to be able to support with fellowships and we just aren't able to. Um, I would not be deterred from applying again if you're still interested. Uh, the flip side of the coin is when I've looked at the data that I find that, for example, with the flagship residential, usually about four of the eight um, applicants that are accepted in every cohort have previously applied. So it is not unusual at all for someone to have applied multiple times before being accepted. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I do always like to underscore that even if you're not accepted, know that, you know, we are your neighbor in DC. We want to be good ecosystem partners. Um, and so, you know, don't hesitate still to like kind of reach out, keep in touch with us, feel free to reach out and keep in touch with me. Um, but yes, we do recognize that there are so many amazing people doing really incredible work in DC. And that's part of the reason we continue to develop more intensives because we're like, how do we scale ourselves to be able to champion and support more people? Perfect. Thank you for that, Caitlin. A couple other questions have come through in the chat. Um, please, if you guys have questions, please continue to drop them in the chat. We're going to continue to just fill those until we get to our time. Um, so the next question, will Halcyon support legal cannabis businesses looking to support equity of opportunities in that market, particularly, particularly for those who have been harmed by the war on drugs? You know, that is such a good question. And I don't have the answer to it, right? Because it is this interesting position where we are in this kind of legislation, you know, as legalization is happening. I would say we are sector agnostic, so that would lead me to believe that yes, it's you know any any legally functioning venture, and if you're um, if you are um, like functioning within the boundaries of like the legalized cannabis in like. Industry, I wouldn't see any reason why you would not be eligible, uh, but I also do recognize that that is something where the, um, the landscape is changing all the time in that. And so I think if you wanted me to like drop me an email, I'm more than happy to kind of um, shoot it up the chain just, you know, before you're investing time in your application. But um, 
as like again as long as you're participating within like the boundaries because i do think that there is a real like you said equity standpoint and impact standpoint there Perfect. And we'll be sure to drop your email in the chat as well so people can follow up on that. Um, next question. I have a food truck that services downtown D.C. government workers from time to time. Would I apply for the DMV fellowship as well? You could if you were interested. So if um, if either you were based in what would be a designated opportunity zone or if the food truck was being based in primarily serving individuals within a designated opportunity zone, then you could apply for that um, as well as the flagship residential. Perfect. I'm a media company. I am a freelance journalist who reports on issues um, pertinent to DC. My work is media agnostic, television, radio, podcast, newspaper, and magazine. Would I be eligible to apply? Yeah, absolutely. We've had several media companies um, come through before. We have a couple that are actively in the fellowship. Um, one is Block Live Block News, and they're actually looking at like localizing uh, media coverage. So recognizing that um, really looking at hyper focused media within communities to benefit communities. So yeah, absolutely. Media ventures are eligible to apply, and we've supported them in the past. Okay, and that was the second part. Has there been any media company that has successfully applied for Halcyon? So you ordered, you answered that. Yes, there has been. Perfect. Um, is there a business size that is preferable, i.e., startup versus established business? Yeah, um, another great question. So we typically are looking at from, like I said, as early as having an idea, like very, like almost pre-startup in some ways. Uh, to about $500,000 in yearly revenue. Uh, and the reason that we have that limit is just because we find that once someone is able to be generating half a million dollars in revenue every year, they kind of have a lot of things figured out, right? Like they know who their customer segment is. They've proved out their business model. Um, so I think a lot of the resources that we offer um, might not really be supporting where they are because they've kind of figured out a lot of those things. Uh, that being said, we have had businesses in the past who have been accepted who have beyond, been beyond the $500,000 mark, um, either if they were making a really major pivot in the business um, and they really still needed some of these more early stage supports because of the change the business was making, or for some businesses we've had where they've received a lot of money in investment, but they're still very early. So like we've seen this for like some of our like example, our medical devices that we've supported in the past. They may have raised a lot of money, but they're still prototyping and building out the device. So even though on paper they look like they're like very far along in practice as far as the business development, they are not as far along. Um, but really when we're thinking about a lot of the supports that we offer, it is for more like a startup early stage, like how are you thinking about growing your team? How do you prove out your business model? Um, how do you prove out like your idea as far as your customer acquisition and how do you refine that kind of those types of topics? All right, another question has two has come through. Um, I have a landscape business specializing in environmental landscaping in underserved communities with a mission of training and employing residents of those communities. Would Halcyon consider this a scalable business? Yeah, well, one, I think, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head as far as impact in multiple ways. So that's fantastic. I think that it, it could be scalable if your vision is to scale it, right? So if you say, I currently serve X number of houses and I have X number of employees and I'm doing good business. I'm satisfied with that. Like, this is what works for me. Um, then we probably would not be looking at it that way, but still like applauding you in that decision. Because like I said, not every business needs to have its goal to scale. And I think that's really important for people to keep in mind. If you were looking at this and saying like, oh, this model is working really well. It meets a need on multiple fronts. Like I would love a way to either continue to grow the like the number of houses that we're serving or you know individuals that we're serving or like how do i like um look at like spinning off this model that maybe i have like a start this model but i started in a different community or maybe i franchise this model out if you are thinking like oh there are ways i want to replicate what i'm doing and kind of 
it's almost like throwing a stone right in a pond. I want to see those ripple effects start to come out and I see those ripples having the potential to get really big, then yes, you know, we would consider you, you know, scalable, but it's really a lot of it's about what your vision is for your company as well as like for your life and your lived experience. Okay, and in relation directly related to that question, if my business is a standard size, but my social mission is how I hire, specifically providing training and workforce opportunities for communities and groups facing barriers to employment, would that be considered social entrepreneurship? You started to touch on this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, right? Like, so yes, right? Because part of baked into your business model is like, not only am I figuring out the ways I'm gonna make money, you're also figuring out how your business is improving lives. Uh, so yes, absolutely, purpose would be a big part of that. So yes, you would be considered within social entrepreneurship. Perfect. Um, what are the thoughts on a solo member owner fellowship or should we have partners or members and others on our team included? Yeah, so it, we allow applications from both, right? So we have had and we've supported solo founders in the past. We've also supported um, when you apply, you can apply for up to, with up to one co-founder. So if you do have a co-founder, you could apply. You couldn't apply with a team member, but you could apply with a co-founder um, if you're interested in doing that. We've also had situations where someone had a co-founder, but their co-founder did was not interested in participating for whatever reason. Um, maybe they needed to stay, maybe they're from California and they needed one you know, founder to be on the ground still in California and one founder could come and join us um, for whatever the reason was. So if you have a co-founder, you are not required to apply with your co-founder, but you can apply it with up to one co-founder. The important thing is that at the CEO or the primary decision maker needs to be applying. Um, and the reason for that is just because a lot of decisions have to get made while you're in the fellowship program, opportunities come up, and we just want to make sure that the person that's there that's getting presented with these opportunities is the person in the position to make the decision for the venture. Okay. Um, if I want to look at this, but if I want to look at this opportunity, but apply next cycle, how do I sign up to receive notification of future rounds of applications? Well, first, I love that question and our communications director would love that even more. So thank you, um, because I should have included that on this like last slide. Uh, if you go to our website, there is like a email sign up that says how to stay up to date with Halcyon. Um, the other thing I want to flag is that Halcyon is at a very exciting time from like our visual branding perspective that we are making a transition. And so I've used like the traditional branding that we use, but if you start to see like a different looking bird that's in blue cropping up, you are still at the right website. You are still at Halcyon. Um, we're just like, literally it's like today is the transition point. Um, so I don't want anyone to be confused if visually it looks different when you go to our website. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and it looks like this is our last question that has come through. We're right bumping up against time, but what is the process once the application is submitted? Timelines. Yep. Absolutely. Wonderful question. So the selection committee does not begin reviewing applications until after the deadline closes. So like if you were to apply today or if you've already previously applied and you haven't heard anything, that does not mean anything. Um, it's just that the selection committee reviews all the applications at once. Once the application actually closes, you will get an email from me or a number, another member of the Halcyon team that kind of gives you benchmarks as far as timeline is what you can expect as far as receiving a notification. Um, internally, Halcyon will go through several rounds of review with different stakeholders, so like team members, uh, fellows, as we kind of work to whittle down the applicant pool from the initial submission to the finalist. Once we kind of go through about three rounds, usually of review, because we do want to make sure that we're looking at each application and we're giving it a long read and time investment. Once we have kind of identified who the finalists would be for the individual fellowships, the finalists would be contacted and invited to a virtual pitch day where you would pitch without slides, just kind of a couple of minutes to tell us more about your venture 
get a chance to respond to questions from our selection committee, um, and then the decision would be made after that. So from a timeline perspective, before the end of the year, all of the fellows should be notified for the fellowships that we're currently recruiting for. And as far as from like a perspective of what might I need to do if I am selected as a finalist beyond just the application, it would just be kind of this, um, I don't want to say informal pitch, but like you don't have to have, you don't have a deck, just like kind of a conversation to tell us more about who you are, what you do, your venture, and to respond to questions. I'm just going to come up with a mute for a real quick second. This is Kate from DSLBD, and I just want to say thank you, Caitlin, so much. Uh, we are at time, so we're going to stop the recording, but we are going to share this recording and materials with everyone who registers for today. Thank you for all that you do, and we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all the work that you do.